Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh Human, Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery. We're delighted to present our final Sunday scene of the fall 2020 season, featuring Esri Mondesir addressing artwork by Manuel Mathieu. Esri Mondesir is a Toronto-based Haitian-born video artist and filmmaker. He was a high school teacher and a labor organizer before receiving an MFA in cinema production from York University in 2017. Mondesir's work draws from personal and collective memory, official archives, and vernacular records to suggest a reading of our society from its margins. His films explore migration and exile as sites of identity formation, as well as cultural resistance. So today, in a pre-recorded uh, video, Mondesir will discuss Manuel Mathieu's exhibition, World Discovered Under Other Skies. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Izzy Mondesi. I am an artist living here in Toronto, the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Yuan Wendat, who are the original owners of uh, this land. I would like to thank the power plant for the invitation to speak with you today. I also uh, would like to thank Professor Warren Krishlaw for his continued support, as well as I mean Al Saden, Nancy McCain, and Bill Morneau for curating this amazing exhibition, Manuel Mathieu, World Discovered Under Other Skies. <clears throat> Finally, I thank Manuel Mathieu for creating such powerful and urgent art. I had the pleasure of visiting the show twice, and I experienced a very strong connection with Manuel's work. I was, of course, taken by the vibrancy of the work, but interestingly, I had a very um, auditory experience as well. I could hear sounds of revolt and celebration, um, cries of terror and jubilations alike through Manuel's uh, paintings and other work. Above all though, through Manuel's work, I feel um, a connection to a particular land, a particular history and culture. It is about that connection that um, I would like to speak with you this afternoon. A couple months ago, I watched an interview with Naomi Osaka the 20-year-old tennis player, three-time Grand Slam singles champion, who has been ranked number one in the world by the Women's Tennis Association. The interview followed the 2020 US Open, which Osaka won for the third time. But this time, for seven consecutive games, she wore a face mask that bore the names of Black folks murdered by the police in the US. The ESPN journalist was asking Miss Osaka about her protest and her activism in general. When she replied, um, my dad is Haitian, we do this, it's in our blood. She said uh, that with, with a smile and in a matter of fact type of fashion, as if everyone listening should understand what she meant by, we are Haitians, we do this. <clears throat> what does that mean? That was the journalist's follow-up question, and for good reason, I think, or maybe. But really, what makes Haiti so special that these Haitians expect everyone to know about their history? By the way, I'm one of them. 
and so is Manuel Mathieu. Manuel Mathieu. I was born in Martisan, in Port au Prince Haiti, in a neighborhood called Habitation Leclerc. I say that name because that's where Catherine Dunham lived during her time in Haiti. Now I would have, you know, I would love to say that Catherine Dunham was my neighbor, uh, but that was in 1936 when she lived there. So it was 50 years ago before Manuel was born in 1986. Now that's really where I wanted to get uh, because I really love talking about the mid um, the mid eighties um, because I, I I feel like they are the formative years of of my life, but also because specifically nineteen eighty six. If there was ever a time when my generation of Haitians was the most hopeful, it must have been um, in nineteen eighty six. It was a Friday, February 7th. My family woke up to the sounds of celebration on the streets. Women, men, and children with tree branches in hands were stomping on the pavement in perfect rhythm with the drums, the trumpets, the vaccines, uh, but also pots and pans, anything capable of producing sound. They were dancing and chanting, the monkey's tail has broken. The gag has been removed. It was a beautiful thing to experience as, a, as an 11-year-old. What were we celebrating? Well, the Americans and the French in the wee hours of that morning came to give their protege baby duck a ride into exile. That was the end of more than 30 years of repression of our freedom of expression, 30 years of human rights violations, um, political assassination, and the dilapidation of the public treasury. That February, though I was 11, as I said, I knew I was living a special moment. I, I could feel it, I could see it, uh, and hear it all around me. The months that followed were a, a, a time of exciting cultural renewal. The, the Creole language and Haitian root music regained their rightful place in the mainstream. Freedom of expression was restored. It was a culturally fertile period. The church that I would go to was really a cultural hub. Folks were talking about um, um, liberation theology. Smith was an African studies student. I remember Jean Faro was a, an art history student. Tolbert was an economist. Um, these were the big boys because we were, you know, we were young. But the young ones were, were like sponges, um, you know, taking in everything. Gary uh, was an excellent singer and drawing artist. Um, Bonnell is still a, a great poet in Haiti. I, I learned to play the guitar and we were all into Mano Chalmain, Vito Vaubat, those musicians really who were um, leading the movement with the lyrics of their songs. Yeah, like we, uh, change was coming and, and we were getting ready, uh, but also change was already there. And, 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 you know, I felt, we felt like we were part of it. But not everyone wanted change. And the ones for whom change was inconvenient had money. They had guns. They had the US trained army. They had the American, the Canadian and the French governments on their side. Then they massacred people who wanted to vote in the November 1987 elections. In 1991, they took the duly elected president Titid out of the country, imposed an embargo while the capital became a no man's zone. And once again, they made it hard for us to stay home. And we became boat people again, our dead bodies washing the Florida shores. And once again, we were not legitimate refugees. Once again, we were not Cubans. We were Black and 
patients. Catherine Dunham, which I mentioned um, earlier and for whom um, and about whom I made a, a short experimental video, went on a hunger strike at the age of 82 over that uh, specific episode of anti-Haitian sentiment in the US. Is that why everyone should know about Haiti's history? We are Haitians, that's what we do. What does that mean? I can still hear the ESPN journalists ask of Noemi, um, Naomi Osaka. Noemi is my daughter. <laughs> In October 1994, they brought the elected president back, or what was left of him. Many did not recognize him. I did not. But the Lord had given, the Lord has taken away. Or in this case, the Lord has taken away and brought back. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's what my grandmother used to say in French, a language she didn't speak, but that was the language of uh, her Bible. And Gary left, and Jean left, Tobert left, Woodney left, Isabel left too, Mirta left, and was smart, and I left too. My father left Haiti, he was 12 years old, says Sylvia in my short film, Una Sola Sangre. Her father arrived in Cuba from Haiti in 1920. At that time, Haiti was under US military occupation. I meet Sylvia in Havana in 2010. She speaks Haitian Creole as fluently as she speaks Spanish. She cooks Haitian, she cooks Cuban, she's a proud voodoo practitioner and she knows a lot about Santeria. She's in her 60s and she had never set foot in Haiti at the time of our meeting. You Haitian too, Sylvia? I have two homelands, but I only have one blood. My blood is Haitian, therefore, I am 100% Haitian. See, the blood uh, business is coming back. So Sylvia, who was born in Cuba, and Naomi Osaka, who, were born, who was born in, in Japan, share the same blood. And then the earth trembled. My cousin Nadej, tells me that following the earthquake, Woodrai, the major road to our house in Paloma, is now an open morgue. Corpses are lined up along the side of the road in the separation in the middle. The high school where I used to taught uh, um, literature had flattened. Brignol, the dancer I knew, is dead. My friend Jack, is still under the rubbles. Grab your stuff, Pariah, my brother. It's time to leave. Where to? Well, Brazil, whose military is leading the quasi-occupying force called United Nations Civilization Mission in Haiti, Minister, has established a humanitarian visa for Haitians, you know? The Olympics game are coming there. They need folks to work on the construction sites. So we good, bro. Oh, and did I know, did I tell you that Haitians don't need a visa to enter Chile? So they left. Mathieu left, Colonel, Wood, Saïd, Snoop, Khalifa, Grimaud, Madame Jézy, Jevela, baby, they left. December 20th, 2018. I have been in Tijuana, Mexico for three days now. Bab, the owner of the Haitian restaurant slash store slash community, community center down the road, told me that the Haitians have been coming here since 2016. They took the route, he says, hoping to get to the United States. Haitians, after a perilous journey, find door to US abruptly shut. 
New York Times, September 13, 2016. The Wood. Wood, who is 19, tells me that he and his brother came to Tijuana from Brazil by car, by foot, buses, and small boats. They crossed nine borders in total, Brazil to Peru, through Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, Panama, Nicaragua, and then Mexico. Now they are in Tijuana. What now? Pull over. Yes, sir. Where are you guys headed? We are going to Dresden, sir. What's in Dresden? Well, we are filmmakers. We are making a movie about racial segregation in Dresden, Ontario in the 1950s, sir. Have you heard about Bernard, uh, you Bernard, sir? He was an army veteran who founded the National Unity Association in Chatham area in 1948, sir. Their struggle resulted in the passage of a very important law in this country, sir. In fact, too, the Ontario Fair Employment Act in 1951 and the Fair Accommodation Practices Act of 1954, sir. Yes, sir, I'm Haitian. In all due respect, sir, this is a dumb question to ask. There's no migration crisis Humans have been moving around the globe forever. This is one way we solve our problems. That's how your people ended up here too, sir. The only difference is that they were not met with the violence that modern day migrants have to face. If you don't believe me, sir, you can read Sonia Shah's book, The Next Migration, The Next Great Migration, <clears throat> sir. Yes, sir. 100%, sir. My people have been screaming Black Lives Matter for over 200 years now, sir. We got tired of producing sugar for the entire world as slaves. The Code Noir, which regula regulated the conditions of slavery in the French colonial empire, defined us as material property. As such, sir, we were malnourished, beaten, we would be branded, we would have our ears cut off, our arms cut off, or we would be executed if we tried to leave, sir. So we started to fight. A full-fledged war lasted between 1791 and November 18, 1803, sir. I remember November 18, that's my son's birthday, sir. Oh yes, sir. Yes, yes, most of the slave masters perished with their families. Yes, sir, extremely violent what these people did to the slaves, sir. But on January 1st, 1804, we declared our country independent. Lots of us still think that we are paying the price for that. Sir, am I free to go now? Sir, I reached out to April Mais, chair of the history uh, department in Pomona College in California. And we talk about her recent presentation titled, Being Haitian Means to Live. April explains that the title of her talk was taken directly from her conversations with Maxo, another Haitian in Tijuana. The young men had talked to her in great details about the circumstances in Haiti that prompted his departure. According to Maxwell, the friends of Haiti, the international community, had made it impossible for young Haitians to stay home by imposing their own economic and political ad agenda onto the country. He's right. Embargoes, military occupations, financial support to dictators for geopolitical dominance, uh, neoliberal economic policies, interference in local politics, you name it. So when a young man crosses an entire continent 
to pursue his dreams uh, of becoming a musician in the United States. This kid is, is, is resisting. Being Haitians mean to leave. To leave is to resist. Therefore, being Haitian means to resist. Here's per, uh, perhaps the syllogism Naomi Osaka wanted um, the ESP and journalists to get right away. But does that make Haitians unique? Why should the world care about Haitian history today? Last year, the Caribbean lost one of its most brilliant minds in the passing of Michael Dash. Dash was a Trinidadian scholar who devoted his career to the field of Haitian studies. Speaking to a Caribbean audience in Jamaica in 2004, he declared, we are all Haitian. <clears throat> because just like CLR James before him, Dash understood the foundational character of the Haitian revolutions for all Caribbean people. But Haiti's significance goes beyond the Caribbean region. Dash argues that Haiti's symbolic presence in the Caribbean be understood in terms of the project of modernity and radical universalism. The Haitian Revolution, he says, was another point in interactive global history. But here's why I think this concerns us all today. Dash says again, it symbolized speaking of the revolution, of the Haitian revolution, it symbolized the possibility of understanding human rights beyond race and territory. Yes, officer, as I said, we have been screaming Black Lives Matter for over 200 years now. As the world reckons once again with the idea of freedom and liberty for all, Manuel's work offers us an opportunity to think about the ideals that Haiti represent. The most difficult reckoning I think that artists have to endure at the beginning of their careers is probably that of figuring out what their art is about. Manuel uh, um, speaks of a cathartic moment after a car accident when he decided to center that particular land, that particular history, that particular culture, which I talked before in his work. Let's just say that I had my own accident when I decided that I should draw from, you know, all that wealth of ideals and history and culture to create art. I do not make that choice to satisfy some um, nationalistic tendencies or to seek some sort of comfort um, in insularity. On the contrary, I make that choice because I want my, I want to ground my perspective of the world in that vision for the world that my ancestors designed with their flesh and blood. When Naomi Osaka says we are Haitians, this is what we do. It's in our blood. Sure, uh, that can be heard as we have bragging rights, but it also can be received as an invitation to, to say, um, just like Michael Dash, um, we are all Haitians. In the sense that the Haitian revolution laid the true foundations for our modern democracies. It also means that each of you in this chat with me now can claim being Haitian, if in fact being Haitian means to resist, to fight, and to dare to imagine a world that is radically different than the one we find ourselves today. Being Haitian would compel us to reimagine 
or art institutions, or political systems, or social movement and values. And we imagine our education system and health systems, policing, etc. Radical imagination. That's what being Haitians mean. Are you Haitian? Thank you. Well, thank you so much to Ezri Mondesir for sharing his insights. Um, we are incredibly appreciative. Um, of course, the power plant is closed to the public um, because of COVID-19, um, a real tragedy because Emmanuel Mathieu's exhibition uh, will close on Sunday, January 3rd. Um, so I'm uh, not quite certain that it will reopen to the public, um, but I highly encourage you to log on to thepowerplant.org and go to uh, the exhibition page. And if you scroll down, you'll see that there is a virtual tour. Um, so on your computer screen or on your smart TV, you can step your way through the exhibition zoom in and take a really close look at artworks. Um, we've also embedded audio uh, of all the wall signage, all the wall texts, as well as uh, stops uh, for our slow looking uh, guided audio tour, which gives sort of an enhanced description of select works through the exhibition, uh, as well as I uh, explores some of the possible meanings or interpretation of those works. Um, so there are uh, three or four stops in Manuel Mathieu's exhibition of that audio guide um, as well. Um, once again, this was our last Sunday scene of the season. Um, our programming will um, ramp up again for next winter season, uh, starting at the end of January. Uh, please check out the powerplant.org, um, sign up for our e-newsletters. Uh, we don't bombard you. Um, so just one or two a week, maybe one a week uh, to keep you informed of what's going on. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to info at the powerplant.org. Uh, once again, I'm Josh Human, the Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Power Plant, uh, thanking you so much for tuning in for today's Sunday scene. Have a good day. <laughs>